Amen. You know, pastor is making me feel guilty. I forgot my wedding ring at the hotel. I hope my wife is not watching this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Um, once again, can we celebrate pastor and mama? You know, where I come from is, is, is daddy and mommy. You know, we don't necessarily recognize you by your title. We just know that you are a cover. So you are daddy and mommy. <laughs> right? So celebrate daddy and mommy. The Wilsons. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, the, the, the turnout today is, is massive. And it shows we are really ascending. And it's good. I'm sure if the Lord had not helped us the previous sessions of this meeting, um, you wouldn't have come. So it's proof that God is doing great and mighty things amidst us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And Pastor Robert, I celebrate you. I celebrate you. I love you. <laughs> Amen. Um, Pastor Oliver, such a gathered man. He, you know he's gathered. He's, he's collected and gathered. Such men are, 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 are scarce. I celebrate you, sir. Thank you. And to the men of God here, it's an honor seeing you and sharing fellowship with you. God bless you. Thank you. And to the mommy that came out from out of town that was celebrated. Can I also celebrate her? <laughs> mommy, we celebrate you. We celebrate you. You are welcome in Jesus' name. Don't worry. In the course of the meeting, you understand why I'm celebrating her. <laughs> Amen. And um, to everyone, Minister Felix, oh my, is that your wife? These guys are terrible. Hey, Jesus. <laughs> you don't mean it. What? Okay. Don't worry. You know, last night I was looking for you. That place we went to, I turned and you had disappeared. Something came on me. I wanted to fall on you. You, dis <laughs> you disappeared. You will not escape it. If you escaped, what's the name of that place? Is it Lunga Lunga? If you escape Lunga Lunga, you not escape Tika Road. You will not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pastor David, the person that has been carrying us about, God bless you. Such a wonderful man. You know, we came in and I told you I came in too cold. I, I wasn't expecting it. Where I'm coming from is hot. So while we're going out, I was literally shivering. And he said, okay, why don't we stop by the mall to get the jacket, something thick. So I got something thick for me and got this. You know. When I, when I saw the price on the, the jacket, I said, Jesus. This can be converted into... <laughs> you know? You know, but that I, I really appreciate. I'm grateful. God bless you. God increase you. Thank you. I don't know how to celebrate you, but thank you. And the men on the media, you know, I love the way you project these things. It comes out. You know, one, one of the things I've noticed about this house is excellence. You guys, you guys. And, and the thing is, if you are not excellent, even if you, you grow, you won't be excellent. Are you hearing me? Uh -huh. You know, I used to tell my people that a rich man is not considered a giver. You are not a giver because you have. You are a giver because you are a giver. So we know if you are a giver when you are broke or poor. You understand? So I'm saying that to say that even though you've not gathered the whole of Nairobi, you have maintained some level of excellence. Oh, come on. And it's beautiful. And you know, in the last days, God is trying to balance two things. He's trying to balance excellence and power. Yes. He's trying to balance excellence and power. So the word comes with precision. He's able to transform the lives of people. And then there is excellence on ground. Not this one. You are doing announcements. Somebody is walking. Um, come on. Where are you? Um, um, no, no, no. There is decorum. There is order. In fact, where spirits tread, you find order. Anywhere you see that there is disorder. Check. The spirit that powers that place is not of God. One of the proofs of the presence of God is order. 
everything falls precept upon precept. Even the word of God that you receive is precept upon precept. So, one of the proofs of the presence of God over a people in the midst of a people is what? Excellence. Check the way they dress. Check the way they talk. Now somebody comes here and he's saying, um, now wow. As if they're acting in a Nigerian movie. No, no. <laughs> you see decorum. You see excellence. The choice of words are, are superb. Somebody listening will know that these people are not stupid. You know, some people don't come to church because they want a miracle. They come because they want their lives gathered. And so when they come and sit under you, it is not everybody that will listen to Peter. Mm. Some will listen to excellent people like Paul. The guy stood before Agrippa and the, the man, the king, heard him. He said, Kai, you almost got me converted. Too much learning. Too much. You are a man of excellence. So there are people that will not minister to kings until excellence is, is become their watchword. You see, this is just appreciation. <laughs> And the man from Mombasa, you will not live empty-handed. Something will come on you in the name of Jesus. You are celebrating Jesus. Do it better. Do it better. Do it better. Do it better. Can you quickly take your seats as I drag you into the presence of God even further? Yesterday, we began to define certain terms, we try to establish what worship is and the need, the reason, the purpose of worship. And we looked at John chapter 4 where Jesus had a conversation with a certain woman called the Samaritan woman. And initially the conversation started from a place of just head knowledge knowledge about environment you know it was about water right and the discussion started from there and then as they progressed the woman said I perceive you are a prophet and so she had to assume another posture a religious posture before now she was just a normal street woman who would happen on any man <laughs> all right and Jesus looked like some fine guy to be added to, you know, her list of many men. So, but as they began to converse, the Bible says she perceived that Jesus was a prophet. And then she assumed a religious status. She hadn't the life that Jesus had. She hadn't the life of worship. But she thought she could talk about worship. So she told Jesus, and now that I perceive that you're a prophet, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you, the Jews, say that worship should be carried out in Jerusalem. Jesus said, we have left that place. The reason why you don't know what we are doing now is because we are not spiritual. We have left you. Worship right now is no longer about a location. It's about a personality. So Jesus said to her, ye worship what ye know not. And I established to us that everybody by birth is a worshiper. Everybody. Everybody. You see, worship is a function of belief. Alright? Anything you believe and you are committed to. So, I established to us that even atheists that disbelieve the existence of God actually believe that God does not exist and it's a form of worship. Okay? And so, but my emphasis was that Jesus told her, you worship, but the problem is that you don't know what you worship. So, we began to, you know, excavate scriptures to find out who we worship and the requirements for the kind of worship that this personality or entity or deity called Jehovah requires of us in worship. And we considered Abraham who happens to be the father of faith. And the Bible speaking in 
Isaiah, we read Isaiah what now? Isaiah 51. He says, hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness. He says, look unto Abraham your father, and to Sarah, the woman that bade thee. He said, I called him alone. I called Abraham alone. And then I blessed him. And then I increased him. And we established that the first thing that introduces you into the life of worship is the call of God. And this call is not a call into ministry. All right? It's a call to consecration. A call to be with God, to love God, to fellowship with Him, to have intimacy with Him. It is from there that God begins to bless you. When God calls a man, the first thing is not to bless him. When God encounters a man, the first thing is an instruction. Genesis 12, he said to Abraham, get thee. And now, the Lord said, now. And you see, when God gives you an instruction, <laughs> he's not waiting on your time. His instructions are carried out in his own time. See, now, the Lord said to Abraham, get thee out of thy country, number one. And I told us that country is a form of identity. That's why I came to Kenya with an international passport, a green passport. If I lose that passport, I've lost my identity in a foreign land. But God came to a man and said, I don't like the identity you have. Leave it. I want to give you an identity. So he stripped him off of his nationality. That wasn't enough for him. He told him, leave your kindred. Wow. Your community. That wasn't enough for him. He said, leave your father's house. Meaning, that your family, but I don't have any concern with what they are. They don't represent me. I want to start a family with you. And that's why today, a lawyer, a kikui, a man from Nigeria is a son of Abraham. But you didn't hear me. <laughs> are you hearing me? We are all children of Abraham. You don't have to be a man from all of the childies where Abraham comes from to be a son of Abraham. You just have to be a child of God. How do I know if you travel to Galatians, the Bible says, cause the seed that is hung on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Can you imagine? Jesus died just so that the blessings of Abraham will come to you. Can you imagine that? That's how powerful a man becomes when he responds to the call of Jehovah. That Jesus came to die and he said, I'm not coming with new blessings. That thing I gave to Father Abraham is what I've come to communicate to you. But this time, I've come with the promax of the blessings of Abraham. Is somebody getting the gist? Yes. Yeah, so, when God calls you, He calls you to the life of consecration. We saw that all of the scriptures we read, both in John chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, where the word worship was first mentioned, there was no, there was no music there. There was no song that was rendered in any of those places. Worship was talked about as a way of life, not as an activity. I established to us yesterday that you are not human doings. You are human being. So God is more concerned about what you will be than what you will do. Are you getting the point? Now, when you have now come to that place of consecration, consecration there are expectations. The qualities of a worshiper. The regalia of a worshiper. And I want to give you just two of them this afternoon. And then we will pray. And I sense in my spirit that some of you will break into certain realities this afternoon as we pray. Alright? Now, the first quality of a worshiper. As I begin to share with you, you will describe it by yourself. But let me say this, and then you will discover that quality in what I'm saying. There are three E's. Put up your three fingers like this. There are three E's, the alphabet E. Three E's that impact on everybody that becomes a great person. Now, two of those E's impact on every average human being. An average human being. If you are going to be an average person, two of those E's will impact on you. Whether you like it or not, as long as you are born on planet Earth, you are going to have an experience with the two E's, the first two E's, but those that have become great in life have an experience with the last E, which is the third E. So, 
the great people, the average people have encounters with just the two E's. The great people encounter the three E's. So the first E that every human being, this is not the quality of a worshiper yet, right? I'm just, I'm pushing you to that place. The first E that impacts on every human being, every human being, is what you call environment. Somebody say environment. Every one of us is born into an environment. All right? And your environment impacts so much on you. So much on you. Now, the first time I came to Kenya and I was having a conversation with someone and the person said, a guest. I said, sorry, I don't get it. You mean against? All right? Now, the person is learned. The person is educated. And of course, the person was able to communicate. All right? But the reason why that was strange to me is because the environment I come from, it is pronounced as against, not against. All right? So, if I come into this environment, I'm going to have to learn the life of this environment. But the man that lives this environment has already experienced the environment. There's nothing strange here. Are you hearing me? So the first E that impacts on every creature, every human being upon the face of the earth is the environment. You were born somewhere. Even if you were born in the jungle, it's an environment. Every one of us, every one of us. And our realities are sometimes formed by our environment. That's the first E. That's the first E. The second E that impacts on everybody is called experience. Somebody say experience. If somebody has, for instance, HIV or tuberculosis, they have an experience with a certain kind of illness. Is that true? Now, you that doesn't have that illness, if you, if you come to tell them they don't have HIV or tuberculosis, you know, you are simply mocking them. Is somebody hearing me? It's as though you are, you don't care about them. You, you are not concerned about their condition. And that will be understood because they have that experience. That's the experience they've had. A young woman said to my wife that the father cheats on the mother. And the mother told her that all men cheat. So, as she's getting married, she should settle with the fact that her husband is going to cheat on her. As long as the man takes care of her, that's okay. She should, she should be fine. So, that's both the power of her environment and experience. Her mother had that experience and unfortunately is transferring <laughs> the same experience to her. So, every average human being is impacted by the two E's. Environment and what? Experience. But a true worshiper and a man that becomes great in God rises above the both and comes into the E that is called encounters. Encounters are your, your penetrations into the realm that is beyond the natural into the realm that is beyond your experience, into the realm that is beyond your environment. Is somebody hearing me? A man of encounter will come to a man that has HIV and say, you don't have HIV. Where did you get the boldness to tell the person he, doesn't, he or she doesn't have HIV? Because when you visited the realm of the spirit, where you operate from, where you have encounters, there is nothing like HIV there. So when you appear, as a man of encounters, you know, in a certain place, there was famine in the land. Second Kings, where the four lepers, the story of the four lepers, you know, prior to the experience the four lepers had, the Bible says the king was so angry, he sent to Elijah, have you seen what these guys have come to do to us? The other day I wanted to kill them, you asked me to let them go. I am going to kill you, Elijah. So while the people were coming to bring situation report to Elijah, the Bible says, Elijah sent the king and said, tomorrow by this time, a cup of, a bag of rice 
will be sold for one dollar. A bag of rice. You know, that's, that's insane. A bag of rice will be sold for one dollar. Meanwhile, the famine was so strong that women began to eat their children. Do you know why the Bible had to allow that that experience be recorded? Women eating their children. The highest level of human love is, is a woman taking care of her unwind child. The highest level of human love, I mean natural love, is a mother taking care of her infant. The Bible says the hunger was so much that women treated children and killed them and cooked them. You know, you have to die as a mother to do that to your child. But there was an experience that permitted for that kind of atrocity. So, it was so much that the king had to send for the prophet. Send for a man of encounters. <laughs> so, the king reported, the prophet rather, sent to the king. Tomorrow, there's going to be a change of story. And then the Bible says, the man upon whom the king leaned, said, even if God will open the windows of heaven and pour down whatever you say he's going to provide, this will not be possible. A man of experience and an environment was talking to a man of encounters. So the man of encounters said, you will see it tomorrow, but you will not eat it. <laughs> and it came to pass by the morrow, when the lepers had done what they needed to do and God acted, there was food at the gate. People were, food became too cheap. So the man too had the news of the breakthrough. And the Bible says, he began to navigate in the direction of the breakthrough. And the Lord, the word of God came to pass that as he attempted to meet the miracle at the gate, men trampled on him. He saw it. But he didn't partake of it. Why? A man of encounters had spoken. When you are consecrated to God, one of the regalias you must wear as a proof of your consecration is consistent and constant encounters with the Lord. That's why when you come out, for instance, as a minister, you are not coming to minister from your old notes necessarily. You are coming to minister from a fresh source and a fountain. You are coming with something heaven has just revealed to you. And when you speak, according to Jesus, the words I speak, they are spirit and their life. Because when you speak as a man of encounter, you are conditioning the destinies of people. So when mothers look at their children and say, you are a fool, I say, oh, she just conditioned the destiny of this one. You call your child a fool. And then they went to school. Out of 50 students, they took 49 and brought back report card and you are flogging the child. You told the child is a fool. What do you expect? And then, worse of it, if you are a praying mother or praying father, you Satan mistakenly put something on your lips against your child. Hey! You have, you have crushed their spirit and crushed their destiny. You, God, you, know, you know what Moses did? When he went to the mountain, the first time to receive the laws of God. God was the one that carved that tablet and wrote the commandments and gave him. When he took it down and out of anger crashed it, when he came back, God said, you are going to make the wood yourself. This time, huh, you will suffer. So, when as a parent or as a man of God that has interacted with the Spirit of God, wakes up one day and out of anger, you release cause on people around you. You are the same person that will undo the cause. But this time, if you have been fasting for one week, God will extend it to six months. <laughs> so you can't wake up and look at your wife because you, she, she didn't prepare your delicacy or did something that upset you. And you speak evil words. You are already conditioning the destiny of your wife. Say, this woman, you're a bad wife. You are already saying you are the worst thing that happened to my life and Satan will condition her as an evil, not as a blessing. So, a worshipper is a person that has constant encounters. The last time you saw God or God spoke to you was 1st of January 
Ah no 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 you are you are old. You are you are an old person. You are outdated. You don't know what God wants you to do now in a world that is corrupt. In a world that is infested by all kinds of pollutions and devils and evil spirits. You don't know what God is saying. You only know what is happening on TikTok, Instagram and Facebook. Oh come on. Come on, you are not ready to compete with this generation. Meanwhile, even on Facebook, when you make your post, it's just 100 likes. Just 100, 200 likes. So the Bible says, if you cannot compete with men on foot, how can you compete with men on horses? The generation is, is becoming, you see, it's a speed jet generation. Uh, but beyond what you think it is, it's a spiritual generation. Let me tell you, even the people dressing half naked are spiritual. A spirit is powering that reality. Somebody wakes up, a beautiful lady, and all of a sudden she's dressing half naked. And you think she's following fashion. That is not fashion. That is not a trend. It's a spirit. So you just live carelessly. You don't know what God is saying next. You just live like that. Ah! That's not how worshippers live. You live every season of your life expecting an encounter. Encounters are interruptions in the realm of the spirit. God interrupts a man's day. Interrupts an occasion. Interrupts a season. And he's speaking. You wanted to go to the west. He says go east. And everybody is like. But we were going to the west. He says I'm sorry. My director says I should go east. Because I told us yesterday. According to scriptures. A spiritual mind is like the wind. You cannot tell where they are going. A man that has encounters. You can't predict their life. You are planning a program. How are you planning this program? How much Kenya shillings do you have in your account? I don't have Kenya shillings in my account. But I know a God. The cattle upon a thousand hills. You know, I used to misinterpret that scripture, sir. When I sat down and the Holy Spirit showed me the scripture. The scripture does not say a thousand cattle. The scripture says the cattle upon a thousand hills. So it can be one million cattle on one of the hills. <laughs> yes. The hills are 1,000. But we don't know the number of cattle per hill. And guess what? One earth. This earth can be just one of the hills. This entire earth can be just one of the hills. <laughs> your, your, your planet is not the only world God created. You have not been to Plato. <laughs> You've not been to Mars. And some of those planets are bigger than this one. We don't know the realities happening there. They are asking you, how, now that you've gotten admission, how do you have to hope to pay your school fees? Ah, I know a God. The silver is his. Even the gold. That's a man of encounters. Your life cannot be predicted. Everybody's business is crashing. What did you do? Which Baba did you visit? I visited the Baba that sits in the heavens. Are you getting something? A worshiper is a man or a woman of consistent encounters. Your child is sick and both father and mother are crying. Sometimes I don't understand how it is. But mother and father are crying. You know, nobody has received a word from God to comfort the other. And fathers, if you are the one that cries the more, the most in the house, you are actually the baby of the house. <laughs> if your wife has to be the one to always tell you, honey, everything all the time. You know, your wife should tell you, honey, don't worry, everything will be okay. But not every time. Do you understand? Every time you are you are confused. Every time you are confused, you are no longer the head. You are the leg. <laughs> you are not even the neck. You are the leg. You can You are the one they are trample, trampling upon. You can't be like that. You should know what God is saying. Is somebody hearing me? You know. The man of encounters will tell you God wants us to have three children. The first is going to be a boy. The second will be a boy. The third will be a girl. A man of a counter will tell you God wants us to have two children. The first will be a girl. 
and the second will be a boy. The man of encounter will tell you, God wants us to have four children. They are all going to be girls. Ah, why not a boy? We're Africans. No, you have not met the daughters of Zelophedad. Their father died and Moses was sharing inheritances in the wilderness and it was not given to their father because the man had no male child. Guess what, pastor? They came to Moses, the general overseer of the church in the wilderness. Say, give us our father's inheritance. Moses said, uh-uh. I don't understand. It is not the culture here. But let me consult God. When he went to God, God said, no, I'm making it the culture now. Give the girl to what belongs to their father. It's not, every, it's not every male child that is the correct one. So, the one God gives you embrace. It better to take an encounter for you to know that gender is not the issue here. It's about the spirit. The Bible says, for there's a spirit in man. The man there is not male. The man there is both male and female. There's a spirit in man. The breath of the Almighty giveth him on this life and understanding. So, you can have 10 female children, but they become the glory of your life. In the end, it's not... It's not necessarily about who continues with your genealogy. Because if they continue with your lineage and they are all foolish people, you don't have a lineage. <laughs> yeah, it's a foolish lineage. Are you hearing me? It's a foolish lineage. What is most important is what you have done, the legacy you have left. It's not the children you have left. It's the legacy you have left. And the man called Zolefer that left a legacy of four daughters. The girls were no longer human beings. They were legacies. Because they brought about something that was not part of the tradition of Israel. It is from that place that people now give inheritances from, to their daughters. <laughs> Are you getting the point? The man of encounters will know. It was a woman that came and told the husband, an angel has appeared to me and has told us that we are going to give birth to a son. His name will be Samson. This is what he's going to be. And Manoah said to the wife, say, ah, I want to see this angel too. And when the angel came, the angel still spoke to the woman. Say, go ahead. I don't know the problem. I don't know if the guy had, if, if, if angels were allergic to him. <laughs> it was always the wife. He was, he, was, he was a man void of encounters. Each time God wanted to visit the family, say, where is Manoah's wife? <laughs> angels would say she's in the farm. Say, go there. Just go, go to the farm. Forget that man. Go, go to the farm. Thank you, sir. Are you hearing me? How can you be a Christian and angels are afraid of <laughs> visiting you? You are a child of God. God wants you to bet a great destiny. And angels are afraid. Anytime they come, it's Facebook you are doing. Or Instagram. Or you are checking for the latest wig. Mm, human hair. Huh? Say, please, leave him, leave him, leave, leave her. Um... Who is serious in that house? Say the daughter, very young girl. She's she's in the school fellowship. She seemed to be zealous. God will say, please go to her. What we want to do is, is, is the king's business calls for haste. So just just get the daughter, get the daughter, get the daughter, get the daughter, get the daughter. He say, who can we use in the house? He say, um, they brought a housemaid. She prays every night. God will say, okay. Since the husband and the wife are sleeping. You know, the money they've been looking for has come. Please, can we use the housemaid to deliver the house? Yes, so the housemaid will wake up. You know, she's used to waking up early because she has to wake up to prepare the house. So, most of the time, she, she, she wakes up and she prays, interacts with heaven. So, that little window, heaven will take advantage of it. Say, so go meet the housemaid. Meet the housemaid. Let's save this house. If we leave the husband, <laughs> the house. The house will collapse. So, get the house girl. One day, the Lord came to an entire nation. He entered the house of a priest. He left the priest. He went and woke a small boy up. Even though the boy could not understand, God said, no, your heart posture is fine. So, he ran. To, the prophet could understand the speakings of God, but he could not. They were, he wasn't prepared to welcome God. Him and his children. So, God now went and woke a small boy up. That was not part of the family. He said, please, Wake up, wake up, Samuel, wake up, wake up. And the Bible says in the days of Samuel, the word of God was scarce. Encounters were minimal. It was difficult to find an encounter. Meanwhile, a place that has no encounters is a dead place. Even if the, the place is called the house of God. Samuel woke up and now ran to Eli. He said, no, I didn't call you. The guy went back to sleep. 
it happened again. He came back. And I said, no. Ha! So truly God has forsaken me. This is God attempting to speak to this lad. He says, Samuel, my son, the next time he calls you, tell him you are ready to hear. At least, Eli was still of value. <laughs> Even in his backsliding, he says, just tell him, it's God. That's how he comes. Tell him you are ready to hear him. You are about to break into an encounter. Say, but please promise me one thing. When he speaks, he will share it with me. I, 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 men that value the word of God. Promise me if he speaks, you will share it with me. Unfortunately, when God spoke and the message came to him, he was adamant. Because it was about the destruction of his house. And the man said, let God do what he wants to do. And it's a bad place. If God is bringing a rebuke to a man and the man says, let God, if God decides to do what he wants to do, he is telling you so that you will cry for mercy. He doesn't want to do what he wants to do. He is telling you so that you will cry for mercy. He will bring an intervention, not destruction. But the man said, let God do what he wants to do. And God actually did it. <laughs> His two sons died in one day. The ark was captured. When they told him that the ark was captured, the man fell down and broke his neck. When the wife of one of the sons heard it in ch during childbearing. In fact, as soon as she heard the news, childbearing started. And she brought forth the child, named the child Ichabod. The glory has departed. And then she died. You know what that means? Glory has departed, meaning we have no hope of a bright future. They say it's a male child. Oh. It's not a girl. It's a male child. Say it doesn't matter. The gender is not important anymore since there are no longer encounters. What is it? Call him Ichabod. The glory has departed. The reason for going to school is wasted. The reason why your school fees was paid. If there's no glory, if there are no encounters, even the school is useless. Even if we produce medical doctors in our family, if we don't have spiritual encounters, it's a waste. A worshiper is a man of what? Encounters. You must be interrupted by the nudgings of God's spirit. You have no encounter. You want to get married. You are getting married because the girl is fine. Or the man has money. God is not telling you anything. The man has money, but the man does not have long life. He's going to die in two years from the day you get married. It will take an encounter for you to know that that, that is not your husband. It will take an encounter for you to know that you are going to become a widow in the next two years. February, a young man got married in Boko. By early March, he died. In less than one month, he died. The wife became a widow. Encounters prepare you for the future. Every true worshiper is a person of what? Encounter. Are you aware that Jesus was not supposed to, by physical design, he was not supposed to go through Samaria? But the Bible says he must need go through a man, a worshiper, a man of encounters understands the movements of the spirit. So he went through Samaria. And the idea was to take Samaria for God. So when he met that woman, that woman that always had the attention of men. You didn't hear this one. You know, the woman had a, an ordination. But Satan took advantage of it. Each time she showed up, men came. So when Jesus met her, she was the gateway to the city. Jesus captured her and she ran into the city and said, come and see. This man has told me all about myself. Other men have taken advantage of me. This one, this one, this one. When people heard it, ah, you mean big auntie <laughs> has had an encounter? Let's go and see what big auntie has seen. And that was how the whole city turned to God. Jesus knew that he must go through the city. If you don't have encounters, you will not know. Some of you have migrated to cities that God never wanted you to be. It's lack of encounters. Now you are struggling in that place, but you are praying for a breakthrough. And God is saying, no, the breakthrough is waiting for you in Nakuru. You are in Nairobi. Because there are seven things that constitute for your greatness and your destiny. One of it is location. If you miss location, see, you see, they are, the most important of them are three. Time, location, people. 
you miss them, you have missed your destiny. If you miss your location, they, no matter what you do, you are out of destiny. John was meant to cry in the wilderness. As long as he was crying in the wilderness, he was a powerful man. <laughs> so kings went to him in the wilderness. Kings went to him in the wilderness. Is somebody getting the gist? You must be a man, a true worshiper. Is a man and woman of encounters. So when you handle the mic as a singer, eh? you are now worshipping from the overflow of your encounters. You are piercing the heavens. And God can now release on the people. Because when you come to minister, what you are doing is, first of all, you are ministering to God because of the various encounters you've had with him. And then God is ministering to the people. Actually, you don't minister to people. You minister to God. God ministers to the people. That's why if you are ministering, your mother can be sick, but God will heal the person behind your mother and leave your mother because you are not the one ministering. You didn't hear me. It's God. And God will minister to people to the degree to which you are able to minister to him. <laughs> are you getting the gist? You yourself can be dying of migraine headache, yet people are being healed under your ministration. That's because you are not the one ministering to people. It is God. I have been to meetings sick. I mean, I was sick. And then people will come out and say, why you are ministering? I was healed. I went to one of the states in Nigeria recently. And after the meeting, the lady came say, why you are ministering? My, one of my ear, deaf ear opened. I, I, they were, I was done. They closed meeting. I was going to the hotel. When the lady came, I ran. Say, why you were singing? My ear opened. Say, oh my God, oh. Can't we go back and advertise this testimony? <laughs> but there's no time for that. The second quality of a true worshiper is what you call burdens. Somebody say burdens. So the first is encounters. Encounters take you beyond your natural physical experiences, they take you beyond your environment. Alright? Yes, you can be in a place where poverty has wrecked the lives of people, yet you are not poor. And people are wondering, it's because you are operating from a height that is beyond the natural. So after encounters, the next quality of a true worshiper is burdens. What are burdens? Burdens are spirit unrests. Burdens are the issues that bothers God the concerns on the heart of God that he decides to transfer to a man right God has a concern on his heart God is, is thinking about something God wants to deliver a family and then he will come and when he sees a man that is pliable in the spirit he will now drop that burden. All of a sudden, the person becomes restless. Let me show you a scripture. Nehemiah chapter 1. Unfortunately for us, sir, we have just few burden bearers. Few in the body of Christ. Very few. In Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 10, the Bible says, and Judah said, there is so much rust and decay because the strength of the burden bearers has decayed. Anytime you see that people are backward, it's because there are no people bearing the burden. If you go to a family and you see that people are backward in that family and there's a Christian in that family, know that that Christian is not one that has burdens. He's just concerned about himself. What happens to a man of burdens is that it takes away your concerns and puts the concerns of God in fact, the reason why it's called a burden is because when it's on the heart of God, it's a concern. It's a concern. When God puts it on you, it's too heavy, so it becomes a burden. So, most of the time, you find yourself restless. Sometimes you are crying. When it's on the heart of God, it's, it's a concern. Alright? But when God shares it with you, it becomes a burden, a yoke. Sometimes you can't sleep. You find yourself praying through the night. And it's as though you don't have the power to undo that situation but 
why you keep praying God uses that as an excuse you know a question was asked say I seek for a man to stand in the gap I just want to use that man as an excuse to not destroy Jerusalem and Judah Nehemiah chapter 1 can I have it here okay let me read it from here the words of the son of Nehemiah the son of Hekaliah Hekaliah it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel. Now, I prefer King James Version. If you have it, please give it to me. Is that King James Version? Good. Good. I was looking for the word, the palace. So, take note of that word, alright? Where was he? In the palace. Next verse. That Hanani one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Next verse. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Next verse. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, look at this. A man in the palace who is comfortable. Ah. We are not talking about the man that is suffering. Who would say, okay, let's pray our way out of the suffering. You didn't hear me. You know, some of our prayers are sponsored by poverty and lack. This guy was not in lack. He was the cup bearer to the king. The Bible says he lived in the palace. He lived in abundance and plenty. He was, he was settled. He didn't need to concern himself with the troubles of other people. But the Bible says when he heard that the people in captivity were suffering and the walls were broken down, he said, the Bible says he sat down and wept. Chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Chapter 2. Quickly. Chapter 2. Chapter 2 verse 1. Chapter 2 verse 1. I don't want to bore you with the prayer that he prayed. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1. Because the rest of what is written in Nehemiah chapter 1 is, is the prayers he prayed unto the Lord. Chapter 2 verse 1. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of, the, of, of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Next verse. And it came to pass, verse 2, right? Wherefore, the king said unto me, Why is that thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. It was a sin to serve the king with a sad face. The king could sentence him to death. But what has come on me is bigger than the judgment that the king will you didn't hear me I'm ready to lose all of the things I have if God does not settle the youth of this community I'm ready to lose whatever I have if God does not intervene the backwardness in this family is unprecedented God must arise so when I saw the trouble that was upon my family and I went to fast and pray fasted you know for 21 days at the beginning of the year, you know that religious fast? Did that. Ah! My problem was bigger than 21 days of prayer and fasting. My family problem was bigger than that. And then, after that, I was doing intermittently. Three days, one week, I did that. It didn't work. When I got to July, I now did... July, June, July, I now did six months. Now, pastor, I was praying for God to deliver my family. I didn't know that God was making me the deliverer. Mm. Let me tell you, you think you are trying to, to beckon on God to solve a problem. God now makes you a monument for problem solving. That's why scripture says, saviors will rise from Zion. You become a savior. You are not just looking for salvation. You become what? It's, it's the salvation yourself. That's what God does. 
So the guy was ready to lose everything because he had a burden. He didn't care what the king would do to him. And I didn't care what would happen to me. So I fasted, fasted. And then I noticed that it was just beyond family. Ministry came to me in the midst of the prayers. And then the following year, I said, I'm going to take this to one year. Fasted for one year. Went to the hospital and the doctor said I had peptic ulcer. You know, I've shared that severally. I said, I bought it down to have it in my destiny. I mean, I fasted. They had to admit me. Fasted for one year. And I came out. If I look at you like this, you go under power. Say, oh, okay, this is good. This is good. This is good. We can do this again. The sweet thing about God is the more you chase after him, the more you want to chase. Because God gives you a fresh hunger. What God does to you when you chase him is that he fulfills the hunger you came with and then gives you a higher hunger. And the higher the hunger, the bigger your stature in the spirit. Because there are certain territories in the spirit you can't cross except you have a certain kind of stature. I watched the other day. The president was trying to enter a certain door. The current president of my country. He entered and then um, I think the Senate president was trying to enter the door to now push him. No, sir. You, you go that way, not here. Ah, that's stature. That's what happens in the spirit when you grow in rank. There are places that prayer of um, even if people, even if 20 people gather to pray for one year, they won't achieve that because it's about stature. You have gotten to that place. You will come. You won't pray for one year. You make a degree. And the Bible says why he was so burdened before the king. You see, the burdens of God creates favors. The king didn't kill him. Rather, the king supported the cause. So, okay, you can go and leave. Go, go and build the walls of your city. Do you have a burden or you have an ambition? There are two different things. Vision stems from a burden. Any true visionary is someone that has a burden. So if you don't have a burden, what you are running is not a vision, it's an ambition. Hello? If you don't have a burden, there is someone that is saying, God has called me to prostitutes, people in protels. That's a burden. Whatever makes you go there, you are a woman like them and you are going there to minister to them. That only has to be a burden. You don't collect offerings in brutals. So there is no honorarium there. What's taking you there? It's a burden. When we minister to students, they don't have money to give us. But what takes us there? Burdens. I asked one of my superiors one time about rural ministry. He said, ah, no, 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 no. He, he can't go to the village to minister. Wow. I now understood what is power in his ministry. He can't go to the village to minister. Uh, he can't go to the village to minister. He doesn't have a burden. Uh, can't go to the village. Meanwhile, the souls in the village are as precious as the ones in the city. What burdens do you have? And let me tell you something. If God cannot bother you with the things that bother him, this life will bother you. Yes. If God cannot bother, if God cannot, cannot wake you up, say, please, please, I need you to, to pray. Pray. Pray for the land of Tika. Pray for Tika. Pray for Tika. There's an assault by the enemy that is about to come. And you just stretch yourself in the bed. You say, hey, Tika. I'm not even from Tika. I'm from Mombasa. <clears throat> you stretch yourself and you sleep back. <laughs> and then calamity hits Tika. And then the report that comes to you is that two of your siblings were passing the day the trouble hit and they were caught in the fire. Now you now know <laughs> that it's not just <laughs> it's a burden. It's a burden. God does not commit great things to people that don't have burdens. There are limits to how God can use a man. Even if you are consecrated, there are limits to how God can use you if you don't have a burden. 
people are getting married late in the family and then you come to pray you say lord my story shall be different you are a selfish christian my story shall be different and then you come back and you are saying um people don't get married in our family but the lord showed me favor the lord gave me brother john and that brother john is a widower you just manage him so that you escape and claim you have a testimony <laughs> you know there are some testimonies that are actually not testimonies it's just somebody trying to prove a point say me i'm not like my sisters finally i've gotten married a young man was kidnapped by ritual killers when they kidnap you over there they harness your parts for rituals they kill you so when they took him to the place the the babala who looked at him the native doctor i said why did you bring this boy here why did you bring him here he's bad luck take him out they were captured in a bus so the guy said yes i'm going but i'm not going alone i didn't come alone he said young man we are releasing you to go he said no i'm going with the people you also captured why you captured me you know somebody will leave that place and go to church and say, Brethren, praise, praise, praise the Lord. We will shout. He said, that shout is not for my God. That praise the Lord is too weak. It's not for my God. I said, shout, shout, shout. We will now shout and scream. What's the testimony? They kidnapped 20 of us. When we got there, the Babalao said, I am bad luck, so they released me. The others were killed. You are not a man of burdens. You are a selfish Christian. It's not always about you. In fact, when you begin to mature in the spirit, you now realize that it's never about you. Anytime it's about you, know that you are still a baby Christian. A true worshiper migrates from being individualistic to being corporate. It's about us. It's about what God will do with us. So sometimes you walk into the house and you are ministering and compassion wells in your spirit. You are looking at the conditions of the people. You are not worshipping because you are expecting a promotion in the office. You are worshipping because God, if you don't reach out to these people, look at these people. Look at these people. Bless them. And through that compassion, it's a burden. So when you refuse to commit iniquity as a minister, it's actually because you know that God needs you to bless people. A burdenless Christian is a heartless Christian. Heartless Christian. You know, one of the reasons why, Pastor, I, I, I am careful about just throwing words of prophecies because imagine that you come to me and you are lying to me in the name of prophecy. And then I, at the end of the day, I realized that it was a lie. And see, I was so expectant to receive a word from God and you came and you lied to me. Are you getting the point? That's why I'm afraid. Because I know if I sow that, I will reap it. So I'm afraid. You mean you come to somebody God is not speaking to. And then you tell them, this is what I see. Ah. You don't have a burden. You don't have a burden. And that lie you have told, the Bible says, good measure. Press down. Shaking together. The day you are expecting God to speak, 400 false prophets will rise up. I said, toss here the Lord. This and this. Meanwhile, you are going to die next tomorrow. <laughs> but they are assuring you of your victories when God has not spoken. Instead of them to say, cry for mercy. Cry for mercy. They are lying to you. Maybe because you have something to give them. May you not come under such heartless and burdenless men in the name of Jesus. <laughs>